Hi there, welcome to the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation channel. Um, as you can see by the thumbnail, I'm going to talk about who has beguiled you. And in Galatians 3, it talks about who has bewitched you. And this is, a, for me, a very, very important warning um, to the church that needs to go out and needs to be prayerfully considered because it's got everything to do with deception, particularly within the church. You know, the church loves to talk about the deception within the world, right? But this is definitely a focus within the church. So um, I'm going to start off by saying just that this is a, a, a comes from a dream that Donna from um, the Servant of God channel that she dreamed and that I interpreted for her. And Father gave me the interpret interpretation of it. And I was waiting on him for when to post it because that is our agreement and um, between me and Sister Donna. And as things progressed and Father showed me different things, um, this dream of hers kept com coming into my conscious and I just woke up this morning. I knew that it is time and that I can put together what he has shown me apart from her dream um, in this week itself. So, okay, I'm just going to read her dream so that we can just recap on that. And then I'll give the interpretation and within the interpretation, um, I'll discuss the various things that we need to take note of. Okay, so this is a dream. It's called the dark and yellow curtains. I'm trying to stay awake and it is as if I'm fighting against a spirit to stay awake. Someone is in the room waiting on me to tell them something big from the Holy Spirit. I'm almost mad at them. Why are they waiting on me? They can hear from him themselves. I'm looking in a mirror to give an interpretation. I give three interpretations and each time more is added to the word given. Then I say to the mirror, you must rest. I then say to the mirror, it's not time to rest. I look outside and I see yellow curtains blowing in the wind. I hear the curtains calling me. As I get to the curtains, I see the Queen of England looking through her door. I want to see whether there is only one or two curtains. If there is only one, I will leave it. But there are two and I take them. I go back inside and my husband has two black curtains. He tells me that the curtains called him and that he has never heard anything call him. I tell him that the yellow curtains called me and I took them, even though I knew they belonged to the Queen of England. I say to my husband, why are we listening to the call of the black curtains? Throw them out. Do not listen to them. He then hangs these two black curtains over his window as fast as he can. I also hang my two yellow curtains over my window as fast as I can. And that is the end of her dream. Here was the interpretation. Overall, the summary is this dream is about discernment and the quest for truth and how the enemy deceives by coming as an angel of light. You are frustrated in the dream with five things. The spirit attacking you, the people dependent on you, your conversation with the mirror, the yellow curtains calling, and the black curtains calling. So here with the interpretation of the mirror. When you or when Donna speaks into the mirror for interpretation, she is looking into the word of God as a mirror. The word says we behold ourselves in a mirror when we look into the word. This is written in James 1 verse 22 to 23. But ye be ye doers of the word and not just hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So this is about deception. For is any for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. 
Okay, so the focus here is, he's like a natural man. He's not spiritual. He hears the truth. He doesn't do it. And because he doesn't do it, he is still as a natural man. He's not walking in the light of the word of what the word showed him. Verse 24. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Okay, note the word of God first and foremost confronts us with ourselves. Before we seek the word for understanding or revelation, it is first and foremost for the purpose of revealing our heart to us. Hebrews 4 tells us it is sharper than any two-edged sword for reaching right into the marrow of the bone, getting to the heart of issues, dividing soul and spirit and discerning the intents and the motives of your heart. The word is both scripture, who is the word, our high priest, who takes the sword of the spirit and cuts us up as a living sacrifice on the altar. So he's the high priest, we the living sacrifice. He takes the two-edged sword and he cuts up the sacrifice. He divides our heart. He divides between soul and spirit. He goes right into the marrow of the bone. That is what the word does. She gives the interpretation three times and every time more is added. This speaks of added revelation because she is faithful to what he has given her and what she has seen in the mirror. How we discern is directly related to the condition of our heart. The issue of discernment is the issue of the heart, not just facts. You can have a library library of knowledge and deep understandings and still be deceived because of your heart. James 1 verse 14 to 16, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Lust causes us to be drawn away and to be enticed. This lust is the same lust that caused Adam and Eve to be drawn away. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. This is issues of the heart. When we have dealt with these lusts through a process of sanctification, in other words, you've allowed the word to cut you to pieces, right? That is to say, to look into the mirror of God's word and you've obeyed the word. Then our discernment grows and is brought to maturity, not because we know truths, but we know him who is the truth. We know the substance. Your discernment is determined by how much you know him. Not by how much you know between the difference between truth and a lie. He is the truth. The more you know him, the better your discernment. Because in knowing him, you will know yourself. He will reveal your heart to you in the light of who he is. And because you know him, your discernment will be on point. It will mature and grow the more you deal with these lusts in your heart. Okay. Yeshua spoke in parables to others, but not to his disciples. The veil was removed and they understood. And because they understood, more was given. This is why Donna received more every time she gave her interpretation. Okay, she gave three uh, three times her interpretation and more was given. Matthew 13 talks about this in verse 11 and 12. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So the more the Lord God works with your heart and purify your heart, the word says the pure in heart shall see God. The more he purifies your heart, the more you allow the word of God to first cut in your heart, the more your discernment grows, the more you will perceive and discern the things of the spirit, the mysteries of God. Okay. 
Verse 12, For whosoever have, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Right? So yes, you have truth. Right? But because you're not dealing with the issues, the truth of your own heart, you are easily deceived. And that little truth that you have, even that will be taken away from you. And you will see what I mean as I go further in this, in this video. Okay, now the spirit attacking Donna to want her to sleep. And of her um, speaking into the mirror as well. When you speak into the mirror, when Donna is speaking into the mirror, the first time, she is looking at herself. Because when you look into a mirror, you look at yourself. So she's not looking into the word the first time when she speaks. This is because the spirit that is attacking her um, is because the spirit is attacking her and she is actually busy in a war, fighting with the flesh to stay alert because she needs discernment. So the enemy does not want us to be alert and discern. Okay, so she is looking into the mirror and say, you must rest. Okay, that's what's happening in her, in her mind. So falling asleep is to close your eyes. He wants you to close your eyes, which means to darken your understanding. At first, she tells herself, you need to rest. Then she tells herself, it is not time to rest. You see, there's a, a war taking place. There is a battle going on to stay alert in the spirit because of the deception that is so high at the moment and will increase. Yeshua in Matthew 24 mentions four times, do not be deceived. Right? Four times. He starts off with saying, do not be deceived. That is the sign for the end times, one of the greatest signs. And he mentions it four times just in that chapter. So it's important. The flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. The flesh wants to sleep. You must rest. But the spirit wants to stay awake. No, it's not time to sleep, to rest. This is what is happening in her dream before the mirror. It's a battle to stay alert in the spirit and to rightfully discern the word of God. Right? This is why this dream came to Donna. Because it's a message unto us. To say to us, be alert. Do not fall asleep at the wheel. Do not fall asleep before the mirror of God's word. You have to discern rightly. And this video is talking about how we discern rightly. Okay. Mark 14 verse 37 to 38. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Could, couldest not thou watch one hour? Verse 38, watch ye and pray lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit is ready, but the flesh is weak. There is the temptation once again written in James 1. that talks about the lust in our heart that draws us away to be tempted, to be enticed. Okay, the flesh. So people looking to her for the word. She's frustrated with the demand of the people to go that comes to her for a word. There is always this pressure to produce to a degree because it's so much easier for people to come to a person who has, who they deem are very close to the Lord or they deem will hear perfectly from them. They want, they want dreams and visions. They, they want their ears to be tickled. They want to hear all these things. Right? Um, so they come to these people. And there's a demand, there's a pressure, uh, unspoken, unspoken, there's a demand. Okay, and she's getting frustrated in this dream because of it. And she's feeling, well, why don't you go yourself to him? Why are you looking to me? All I want to do is point you to him, to go to him. And this is frustrating. And this is part of the call. When you're a prophet of God, this is part of the call, that frustration. They themselves do not want to look into the mirror. They want her to do it for them. Much like the Israelites expected Moses to go hear from the Lord God, rather than they themselves. The requirement to go up the mountain and to hear from him is to leave all behind and to stand before him naked. 
those who are not willing for this cost, look to those who has come down from the mountain, but fail to see that they too are called to come and seek his face, that he may speak to them. The cost is just simply too great. Okay, so now the yellow curtains that are calling. A curtain call is pointing towards coming back onto stage. So you've got a production and there's a curtain call, which means the curtain is closed, everybody's finished, but the curtain opens again and everybody must come back onto the stage and bow again for the second encore or the uh, applaud. Okay, so she is exposed to the public eye, like on the stage, a curtain call, and everybody's looking to her to perform the next act and there's in the frustration. However, she is guided to go outside and she sees yellow curtains. These belong to the Queen of England. Now, the Queen of England was also known as the Queen Mother. In this context, she does not represent something negative, but rather points to the Holy Spirit, who is as a mother looking through the door. Now, the door points to looking from another dimension or into the spiritual. Okay, so... Doors represent choices, it represents uh, uh, openings for the enemy to come in, but it also represents dimensions, okay, or gateways. So the door points to looking from other, another dimension, the queen pointing rather to a royal assignment from the Spirit of God. This points to the mysteries of heaven spoken about earlier. Because once he's dealt with your heart and you receive discernment and your discernment is sharpening, you start perceiving things and mysteries in the spirit realm. The curtains are yellow because yellow points to warning. Okay, When you go into the images on Google um, for danger signs, they are all yellow. So the curtains calling are the warnings given by the spirit, which we often hear from Sister Donna. So she is looking to see whether there are two. If only one, then she wouldn't take them. But two means that she has received confirmation that the warning is from the Lord. So 2 Corinthians 13, 1 tells us, In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. If I can have to put it in another way, In the mouth of two curtains calling <laughs> shall, um, shall every word be established. Therefore, she takes the yellow warning curtains, the assignment to warn the church. Okay, and where does she take it? She takes it into her house representing the church. And what does she find there? She finds the dark curtains calling. She finds her husband inside the house, which is inside the church, and he too has received a call from curtains, but they are black. She does not like this at all, and she tells him to throw it away and not even listen to it so that they would not be beguiled by it, so to speak saying that he must not listen to the call of the black curtains. This is what the Lord God is saying to us. Do not listen to the call of the black curtains. So her yellow curtains were warnings. So what is these or what are his black curtains? Her husband represents a fellow brother in Christ who is swayed by the call of the black curtains. These black curtains represent those who are continually drawn to the exposure of that which happens in the occult and what the powers that be are planning or have done. He also represents those who seek out ancient scriptures and genealogies, those who lust for knowledge. Okay, Titus 3 warns us of this, verse 9 and 10, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Okay, their focus, these black curtain calls, and the people that listen to these calls are on that which is dark. They are drawn away from the simplicity of the gospel in a quest for truth. However, they are busier with darkness than with light. There is a greater focus on that which is dark. Always focus on the lie and not the truth. 
This is a very subtle deception because it masquerades as light. We desire to expose the work of darkness as the word exhorts us. But in the process, because we forsake the mirror of God's word, the first purpose of it, which is to reveal our hearts to us, we fall into a deep, dark rabbit hole of endless searching of truth with the focus of the exposing the lie. We convince ourselves we are about the truth when in fact we are about the lie. The focus, not the truth, but the lie. And this is very subtle because it is not that Father wants us to be ignorant. It is not that he wants us to discover things. Right? Whether it's discovering deeper meanings in the word of God or whether it's to expose the works of the enemy. It's not that he doesn't want any of those things. It is how much you engulf yourself into these things. It is about where your heart lies. It's about whether you spend more time searching your heart than you are searching the works of the enemy. Because if there's an imbalance with that, you will be subject to deception. Eventually, you will be bewitched or beguiled because of your heart, because you have laid a greater focus and weight on exposing the enemy and deception, not knowing that you are slowly being lured in and losing your focus on him who is the truth. Okay, the word in 2 Corinthians 6 says from verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked <clears throat> together with unbelievers, right? For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? So this was talking about um, eating unclean food from idols. And what I can say by that is, a lot of times when we want to see uh, especially with conspiracy theories and we want to see the darker side of where things have come from, there's a lot of defilement in watching these things. Um, if you are not in the right place and you have not dealt with issues in your heart, you can open yourself to the, the spirit behind the scene of what you are watching and you can easily be drawn away or defiled. And there is a lust for knowledge. There is a lust for darkness. I cannot explain it. It's, it is, it's innate, it's the unknown, it's the mystery, it's the, 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 the wanting to find out what really is behind it. That is why people love horror movies and they, they love these kind of things. There's a lust behind it, a lust for darkness. Okay, so do not eat of that defiled sacrifices. But with your eyes, you eat with your eyes, right? What we see, the word or, or, or the saying is that you eat with your eyes. What you see entices you. You've got a bland meal that's just potatoes, rice, and corn. You know that's very bland. But I mean, if you have a nice steak and you've got uh, your greens with it, and you've got some butternut, and you've got roasted potatoes, you're salivating already. Because you eat with your eyes in the same way when it comes to conspiracy and exposing the works of the enemy. Especially with how technology colors in a picture for us. We start lusting or salivating or covered more knowledge without realizing that we are being taken deeper into the rabbit hole. Being more focused on exposing the lie than being busy with the truth. Who is a person? Christ. Ephesians 5 verse 8 to 12. For you were sometimes darkness, but now you are, are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Right? So we ought to reprove them, not camp out with it. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. So we are to remain pure. We are to be vigilant to protect our hearts. 
Father knows that there are those that get lost in the maze of exposing the works of darkness because their hearts leer them away due to a lust for that which is dark and mysterious. However, there is also another lust that draws us away, that is to say to tempt us. The lust to be right. Once again, this lust masquerades as speaking the truth. But the deception is within the heart. The desire to contend for the truth with brother and sister of which Titus 3 warns us against. If we do not know our heart, which we are told to God with all diligence because out of it flows the issues of life, which includes your ability to discern, that's also an issue of the heart, then we may even proclaim a truth but be in error because of our disposition, because we want to be right, right? Another reason for this deception and being drawn away from the simplicity of the faith and the gospel is because of bitterness. Hebrews 12 tells us, verse 14 and 15, Follow peace with all men and holiness, which no man shall see the Lord, without which no man shall see the Lord. Verse 15, looking diligently. In other words, don't give up, don't stop, never give up, be ever watchful, stay awake. Lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby defile many be defiled. So this root of bitterness, subtle, very subtle. You know, we usually think a bitter person, they just spew things out. You just hear the bitterness the whole time. True. But you must understand when it comes to a religious spirit, it knows how to garb bitterness and a righteous robe fighting for the truth. So it's very subtle that you do not even see that bitterness. And the Lord God wants us to be able to discern beyond what is said. To be able to discern the spirits. How can you do that unless you've dealt and allowed the sword of the spirit first to cut your own heart? You, degree, you discern to the degree of how you've dealt with your own heart. Okay. It's amazing how people can all of a sudden gain new revelation in their search of truth, right? Especially ancient truths. And because they failed to see the bitterness within their heart, right? There was an imbalance. They forsaken the mirror. They defile many by spreading this new revelation. This is what the word says here. Bitterness defiles many. Okay? So many is drawn away by these new revelations, unable to discern the heart of the person that is speaking. It is either by what name to use for God, whether you uphold the Sabbath or not, whether you have to keep the feasts or not, which calendar to use or whatever you are, pre, post or uh, mid. And because you as the Pied Piper do not get the rats to dance to your tune, you grow bitter. They don't, no matter how many scripture you've given them, no matter how many examples you've given them, no matter what you do, they still do not dance to your tune. Right? And so you grow bitter because you're not willing to give this up. After all, you're fighting for the truth. But in reality, you're fighting for yourself. You have not guarded your heart. You have stopped looking into the mirror. You were more concerned with the knowledge and your understanding than protecting the bond of peace within the brotherhood within the church. You have failed to see the snare and that you have been beguiled by the enemy. Leered away because of the bitterness of your heart. And then you start to deviate from the truth, which is to deviate from the narrow path and take others with you in the process. This is a great sin. A great sin. So Donna's husband, the brother in Christ, is hanging these curtains as quickly as possible over his windows. The windows point to seeing or discernment. The windows is like the eyes of a house, right? You see in and out. 
having dark curtains over his windows talks about walking in the dark and that his discernment is darkened. Whereas Donna is hanging the yellow curtains over her windows, her eyes, and it speaks of being aware of the danger, a warning. She sees with eyes of discernment. The fact that both of them are doing this as fast as possible speaks of the zeal and earnestness that this is done within the same house. So there's this zeal, you know, that you have for the Lord and you just dive into, you just want to know the truth, you just want to expose the darkness, you want to do all those things, but you fail to see the warning of what you need to focus on, which is your heart first. It's not that the Lord doesn't want us to warn people. It's not that he doesn't want to expose the works of darkness. It's where your heart lies. It's where your heart really lies and what is true about your heart. Okay. So it's done with great zeal. That is to say, within the church, the zeal that some seek out to expose the enemy would be better off to use to expose the heart and deception of lies within our own heart. If we can use the same zeal that we want to expose the enemy, that same zeal to expose the enemy within, the deception, as Jeremiah 17, 17 says, the heart is utterly weak, uh, uh, wicked and, and des what? utterly deceptive and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, I search the heart. That is why we are to guard our hearts with all, heart with all diligence. Remember, the two trees in the garden are represented as life and the other one as the knowledge of good and evil. Right? Knowledge of good and evil. Note, good is to be found on the same tree. Okay? Good and evil. It seems good and with it you can get understanding. Right? How crafty the enemy is with beguiling God's children, bewitching them. Okay? with that which seems good and gives knowledge. Books are made with paper, which points to a tree, right? However, today that tree of the knowledge of good and evil come in the form of AI or technology. How sad that for convenience's sake, the real felt paper of the word of God has been replaced by that which is unreality. The word of God is reality. If you can hold something in your hand, right? That is reality. When you hold the word of God in your hand, you feel that paper. It's reality. But AI, you cannot touch. It's unreality. And we have forsaken, right, the simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity of the word of God, that which we have between papers. We've forsaken that or we have laid more weight to what we can find out in AI. Okay. Good old-fashioned books. Yes, a lot has been gained for the kingdom of God by the knowledge we've received through technology, right? But more so for the kingdom of the enemy. Sometimes it is better to be shut up with the paper of the word of God, just you and your Bible. If we are not faithful with the paper in its simplicity, why then are we then opening the windows in AI that is endless? Are we not to be faithful more to that which is given, before we venture into the unknown world of knowledge of good and evil. Are we not to be faithful with the little he has given us so that he can give us more? What, what does it help you gain greater knowledge of, of so many things with pertaining to the word of God and Christendom and all that? And you go down all that knowledge and you just... you. In a way, you have a library full of knowledge about the Word of God. You are packed full. But you are anemic. And your library, with the consideration and understanding of your own heart, is like one book. One book. And you haven't even finished reading it. He wants us to be faithful with the, with the few, with the small, the little that is given us. So that He can give us more. So that we can venture out and then go into gaining that understanding more through technology. But now you have a foundation of being established in him. Your discernment is on par. But it's because people's discernment is not on par, because their heart has not been dealt with, that they are leered away 
by the enemy in that tree. Hath God really said? Did he really say that? Let's go search it out. Galatians 3. O foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. He, they wanted to look into uh, uh, circumcision again and the law, and he's telling them they've been made free. Now the word bewitched here in the Strong's is G940, and it means an evil eye. The eye is the window of the soul of your heart. So if you have an evil eye, you have a divided heart, right? Proverbs 27, 20 says, Hell and destruction is never full, so the eye of man is never satisfied. Bewitched means to malign and false representation, to charm. Who do you think is behind fact checkers and the great awakening? It is a false light. It exposes darkness, but in truth, even though it comes forth as light, it is in fact not the light. You think you are busy with light, but you are in fact playing into the hands of the enemy. You are in darkness, not because necessarily what you are saying is wrong, but because your eye is evil. You are convinced you are fighting for the truth. Because you are exposing darkness. Where your focus needs to be him. When you walk in the light, your mere, your spirit is filled with light. And because you are one with him who is light and the truth of God radiates through you, you don't even have to say something to expose darkness because you are in the light and you walk in the light. It's not that we are not to speak against what the enemy does, but we are to be guided by the Spirit. You have bitterness and envy within, and therefore you are allured and beguiled. <laughs> you fail to pray for your enemies. The guile within your heart, the lust for knowledge, the lust to be right, the lust of envy and bitterness, the lust to be recognized or affirmed, all these have drawn you away and are seated within your heart. And when you search the word more for knowledge, whether in paper or technology, you have failed to use it as a two-edged sword. Your sword only cuts one way. It only cuts the ear off of the soldier. This is why it is a two-edged sword. It has to cut into you first before another. It is then when you have stopped searching your heart that you fall for deception to such a point that you are worse off than what you were before you got saved. You have been given over to a reprobate mind, driven by a religious spirit that believes it's doing God a service and will persecute those who are in fact walking in the true light. Know also, this is exactly what the enemy wants. He wants you to lose focus. He wants you to get sidetracked from what Father is busy with in your heart. My rule of thumb. People often ask me, where do I start in the word of God? Where, where must I read? Um, and I always say, what is he busy with in your heart? That is your starting point. If he tells you he's busy with guile, or he tells you he is busy with bitterness. Or he is busy with um, forgiveness or giving to others. Then you search out the scriptures about that. And you let the spirit break open the word of God for you. So that you gain understanding of your heart. So when somebody else comes that walks in error, you then discern out of the light that you have received because you first allowed the word of God to cut your own heart. Then you judge righteously. Isaiah 11 says that he did not judge by what he saw or heard, but he judged righteously. It's not by what you see or hear. It's the heart 
is where you discern from. Okay, Because the word of God has been made alive to you. He does not want us to be ignorant. We are told to be cunning as snakes and innocent as doves. And doves have a single eye. They can only see one thing at a time. That's why they turn their heads like that. When they see something fall, they turn their head because they can only see one thing at a time. They don't have a peripheral vision. So they speak of wholehearted devotion. That's why Solomon told the bride, you have doves' eyes. You have only eyes for me. Your eye is satisfied with me. Okay. Over and over he tells us to look to him. Look unto me. So much defilement is found when we uh, search the dark things of what the enemy does. If you're not in the right place, you can easily be defiled by the, the spirit that is behind it. Okay, And the enemy wants you to lose direction and focus. He wants you to change in direction. And you, if you do not have a trained ear to hear when the spirit says to you, that's enough. You've, this is now enough of this information. I need you to go here. Where is my focus? So even in our searching out these things, we are always to be guided by the Spirit because the Spirit determines when we've had enough, when we need to go deeper and when not. Not our lust for information. Not our lust to be affirmed or to be right or our bitterness. We are to be guided by the Spirit and not the flesh. I want to use an example and I, you know, um, I was speaking to a friend of mine, Chris, and we, I jokingly said something to her. And when I read through all of this that I, I've spoken to you about now, I, uh, I thought of Nemo and, you know, a, a picture speaks a thousand words. So if you can just remember this picture <laughs> as a guidance, that would also be great. But I thought of Nemo, I thought of Dory. And they were hopeless and there is uh, uh, Nemo and he's on the, uh, uh, no, Nemo, what is his name? Uh, uh, Marlin, I think the, the clownfish's name is Marlin and he's looking for Nemo, right? And Marlin is very grumpy, he's a miserable clownfish, he's not happy, not a happy clownfish. So he's sitting on the rock and Dory, frustrating him, comes to him and says to him, what's the matter, grumpy girls? And Mr. Grumpy Gills, she calls him, and then he, she says to him, you know what you need to do when you get into a situation like this? You just keep swimming. And then she starts singing, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. And they, and she says, what do you do? You swim, swim, swim. And she, she goes down and he goes, and he's so frustrated with, him, with her because she's pulling him down. And it gets darker and darker the more they go down. Now, Mr. Grumpy Gills is that bitterness of heart. He's just miserable. He's bitter. Because he cannot find what he wants, right? And she is not helping him. She's an obstacle. So they go deeper and deeper. And then what do they see? A light. They are guided by a light. Deeper and deeper they go. And if you know the story, it's one of these grotesque uh, uh, fishes that you find at the bottom of the sea. Because it has no light. Therefore, they become so grotesque. And it has this little antenna or whatever you want to call it, with a light, which is to lure other fish to come to it so that it may devour it, right? And so they go down and they just mesmerize by this light and they follow it wherever they go. And, and all of a sudden, the light exposes everything that's there and they see this monstrous fish and they run and they swim for their life, not run, swim for their life. This is how some Christians are that are so involved wanting to find out the deeper things and exposing things and also the deeper things just of scripture in general. They just go deeper and deeper and deeper and without realizing it, it's a false light that is leering them deeper and away from the true light, the sun, right? The sun is shining above the, the sea, okay? So it's an example of the sun, Yeshua, and this small light is taking them deeper and deeper. And with one purpose, to devour. To take you away from the true light, from truth. To take you away from seeing your own heart. And thereby deceived, and because of the bitterness in your heart, you defile many. This is a grave warning unto the church. I want to end with this, uh, Proverbs 3. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. 
bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel, and marrow to thy bones. Let he who has ears hear what the Spirit is saying to us in this time of great deception. If there was ever a time to seek him more than ever, it is now. Walk in the light. Walk in the light and then you will never fall or stumble in darkness. Bless you.